Well, good morning. We're glad to see each one here today. And this is our last Sunday for the year 2023, uh, which again, as you get older, you, you look at the t turning of the clock and New Year's coming. It's like, wow, I can't believe every year I say the same thing. It's 2023. Now it's 2024. But praise the Lord, we're here. We have the opportunity to continue to serve him until Christ comes again. I want to share a few announcements this morning and then encourage you to be aware of what's going on in, in the bulletin. Uh, today, after the service, uh, we'll meet back together for a special business meeting uh, considering uh, new members for the church. Uh, so please, as a member, uh, plan to stay and we'll uh, conduct that exciting business of people joining the church. Uh, college and Career will be meeting tonight uh, at 5 o'clock at the Morris's home, and you're invited to come. Going to midnight? No. <laughs> uh, you're invited to come, enjoy the dinner, and um, when Sherry goes to bed, it's over. <laughs> Welcome to stay. Buddy. They can stay, <laughs> But uh, if you're part of that group, please be aware of that opportunity of fellowship. And then the ladies have an event coming up January 13th where they make the baby blankets together. And we take that up uh, to the Oswego uh, Pregnancy Center. And they do use those. I took them up one year and they were so excited, the people, to get them. And they do use those in their ministry. And then if you would just take note of the other announcements in the bulletin, we also have an update on the church building and the finances, and we'll try to share that periodically with you. And we're praising the Lord for what he's providing and looking forward to what he will do as we move into the future. And I look today, and um, it's different this morning. You know why? There's open seats because there's so many people sick. Uh, so we want to pray. Uh, many people are ill, uh, but we praise the Lord for what he's doing, and we look forward to the new year coming up and continuing to serve Christ as a local church. Uh, at this time, we'll have the prelude as we begin to prepare our hearts to worship Christ together.
Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we are thank you this morning for the birth of Jesus Christ, his coming into this world to go to the cross, to pay the penalty for our sin and make it possible for us to be called the sons of God. And then to rise again to give us that same hope that just as he is the first fruits, that we have that uh, hope, that assurance that someday we will be with him and we will be like him. And Lord, I also pray that as we think of the uh, upcoming new year, that we would be committed as individuals and as a local church to living for Jesus Christ and also to live in anticipation that he is coming again. And we pray that he would come soon. We look forward to the rapture of the church. And Lord, I pray that this would not be some truth that we think of now and then, but may it be in our hearts and minds on a regular basis to shape our choices, to shape our priorities, and to keep us uh, living for Jesus Christ. And we thank you for this local church body and each one that is a part of it. We pray that you would use this service to uh, minister to our hearts, uh, that you would use it to bring glory to the name of Christ. And we pray for those who are not able to be here today. We pray for those who are ill, that you would restore their health, that you would encourage them at this time. We pray for those that are traveling, that you would go before them and bring them back safely. And again, we are so thankful for this local church body, each one that is a part of it. And we pray that as we go into the new year, that we would go with unity, that we would go forth with a growing love and faith in you. And may you use this local church to your purposes and to your glory. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we have gladness and of old, did the guiding star behold, as we Star 
See? 
If you take your Bibles this morning and open to Matthew chapter 2, we're going to be looking at verses 13 to 23, and we've been looking at Matthew's gospel related to the coming of Jesus Christ, and some of the songs that we sang today reminded us of what he has been putting before us, uh, his birth in the manger, fulfilling prophecy, promises of God, and I'd say grace and faith, thank you for sharing that, and grace, you handled that gracefully. Uh, <laughs> that is a wonderful uh, thing to hear, and I always remind people, uh, we have a loving church family, anything goes off a little bit, it's okay, <laughs> and I need that too. <laughs> And the other good news is we have an editing of the service afterwards <laughs> that uh, if I make a big mistake, they, they edit it out. I asked our editor today, can you make me look younger? And they say, he's going to work on that. <laughs> but you know, away in the manger, that's Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, prophesied in the Old Testament. Uh, we sang Three Kings, uh, speaking of the wise men. We looked at that last week from Matthew's Gospel. And again, there's the fulfillment of prophecy taking place. Uh, there's God's plan for Jesus Christ to come and for the Gospel to go to all people. Uh, not just Israel, but to all nations. And today we're looking at um, Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 to 23. Uh, events that take place related to the child Jesus under two years of age uh, as Satan, King Herod, attack Jesus Christ, uh, try to have him put to death. And we want to see today that, again, prophecy is being fulfilled. And when you look at Matthew's gospel, he's writing to the church, all of us, obviously, but he has a special emphasis upon addressing the nation of Israel. Uh, he is writing to Jewish believers with them in mind, showing them that Old Testament scripture is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. It's fulfilled in his coming. It's fulfilled as the wise men come. It's fulfilled even as we will see today, as there are are attacks against Jesus Christ trying to put him to death. And this is going back to the Old Testament, showing how God revealed that this was to happen. This would take place when the Messiah came. And so Matthew is making the case, people of Israel, your Messiah has come. The proof is Old Testament scripture said these things would be true of him, these things would happen to them, and that's what has occurred with Jesus Christ. Therefore, recognize him as the King of Israel, the Messiah. But also Matthew is laying out that in God's big plan, it was Jesus who would come, present himself to Israel as their king. They would reject him as their king, in fact, crucify him. But that was a part of God's plan so that now the gospel could go to all nations. The gospel could go to all people. And so Matthew is making that case, and today we'll see that again, as the fulfillment of prophecy takes place as King Herod tries to have Jesus put to death. And so as we look at biblical prophecy, in Matthew chapter 2, let me just share a reminder of what biblical prophecy is. When we talk about prophecy in the Bible, what does that mean? Uh, what does God want us to know? Well, biblical prophecy is the supernatural communication of God to men, to prophets, who were then to tell forth that message to God's people. So God would communicate with a prophet, 
He would say, this is the message that you are to deliver. It was then their responsibility to tell that forth. And when you think of the source being God, that means that the prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, etc., etc., when they were saying, thus saith the Lord, because it was prophecy from God, three things were in play. Number one, it's infallible, meaning there's no errors, there's no mistakes in the prophecies of the Bible. Uh, God said, this is what I'm going to do. God said, this is my message for my people. And it was without error, no mistakes. It was authoritative, meaning it can be trusted as true and reliable. If God told the prophet uh, something about the future, you can count on it. Uh, it's definite because he's the eternal, all-powerful, all-knowing God. Therefore, it would be true and it could be trusted. It also was inerrant. It means it was incapable of being wrong. And so when you look at the Old Testament prophecies related to Jesus Christ, it was certain to occur. And Jesus Christ came and he was fulfilling those Old Testament prophecies that God had shared with his men, the prophets. And so biblical prophecy, it's God giving his message to his prophet. It's his prophet then going and sharing, here's the message. Here's what you need to hear that comes from God. And so when we look at the Gospel of Matthew, he's saying to us, he's saying to the Jewish nation, Jewish people, that look at biblical prophecy in the Old Testament that God shared, here's the truth about the coming Messiah. And then look at the life of Jesus Christ, and he's looking at the beginning of his life, the birth, and then him as a child, and see where these Old Testament prophets were able to say this is going to happen when the Messiah comes. Therefore, you can know that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the King of Israel. And of course, Matthew goes further to make sure they understand uh, but Israel was going to reject Jesus, and they did, but it opened the door to God's plan to bring the gospel to all people. And so we look at the fulfillment of prophecy in the attacks against the child Jesus, the king child. In verses 13 and fi through 15, we have the fulfillment of prophecy in the flight into Egypt. It says, verse 13, Now when they, meaning the Magi and the wise men, had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt. And here you see the faith of Joseph in fleeing to Egypt. But what's happening? Well, if you remember King Herod, King Herod was always looking out for anyone who wanted to try to take away his throne. And when the wise men came and said, we're looking for the king of the Jews, that immediately put Herod on the defensive. And he's looking to find this child so that he can put him to death to protect his throne. And so when God says to Joseph, you need to flee to Egypt, Joseph acted immediately. He didn't ask questions. There's no hesitation. Uh, he believed God. He exercised faith, and he moved his family into Egypt. And you think, well, that's interesting that he would move into Egypt. But practically speaking, it would have made sense because there were about a million Jews uh, that lived in Egypt at that time. So he would have had a group uh, to go and to join, a place to go. But he flees to Egypt. And you notice verse 15. You see the fulfillment of prophecy of Hosea in Joseph, Mary, and Jesus going into Egypt. Because Matthew brings out, verse 15, and was there until the death of Herod, 
that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. So Hosea, in Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, many years before, talked about the Son of Man coming out of Egypt. And that was prophetic in the sense that it's speaking about the Messiah. He's going to come out of Egypt. And you stop and you think, well, how would that happen if you're living back then where the Messiah would come out of Egypt? What did God do? He worked it out for it to happen. Uh, They would flee to Egypt. They would flee to the safety of Egypt and then eventually return, come back to Israel. And it is reminding the people of Israel, the Jewish believers, look at what happened. When God delivered your nation out of Egypt, he did it through a very powerful way. Remember the miracle of the Red Sea. Remember the different miracles that God did to bring the nation of, of Israel out of Egypt. Well, now he's saying what? That's also a plan of God and his power to set up that Jesus would end up in Egypt, the Messiah, but then he would return to Israel. And so as Matthew is making the case, Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is the promised one. Make no mistake about it. And remember Hosea, the prophet, spoke about this happening. Well, here's how it happened. And so you have the first example of fulfilled prophecy. And then you have the second. It's the fulfillment of prophecy in the massacre of the uh, innocents uh, that take place next. Uh, And as you see this, Uh, It's, again, something that you look at and you're like, wow, this is a terrible thing that occurs because of Herod. However, it's, again, God's in control. He's going to protect Jesus. No one is going to put him to death. But you look at verse 16. It says, Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. Uh, There's the emphasis, again, going back to Herod, who he was. This is not something unusual. This was typical for this man. When he heard that the wise men had deceived him, they were supposed to come back and tell him where Jesus was so he could go and worship him, which meant he could go and have him put to death. But remember, the wise men were warned by God, do not go back to Herod, go back a different way. And when he figured out what they did in deceiving him, he was quite upset, and it says he was furious. And so he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. And so what did Herod do? Well, he did something that is just a horrific uh, act. He made it a point. He made it a command. I want all male children, two and under, in these areas where he thought Jesus would be, I want them put to death. And that order was carried out. And if you can imagine uh, the people of Israel, the Jews in that area, as that was put upon them to hand over their child to be put to death because King Herod wanted to protect his throne. That would have caused incredible grief, anguish, anger that would have been taking place at that moment. But this is what Herod did. And then you say, well, why did Matthew in his gospel uh, bring that point out? Well, we look and we see the fulfillment of the prophecy of Jeremiah. In verse 17, it says, Then was fulfilled, when? When Herod did that, what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted, because they are no more. So we see here the fulfillment of the prophecy of Jeremiah. 
that back in Jeremiah chapter 31, uh, he was prophesying that this event would take place. And when you look at this, you say, well, what does this mean when it talks about Rachel weeping? Uh, what would the reader of that day, the Jewish mind, would have thought of? Well, they knew their Old Testament scripture. They knew their history. And they could go back to the uh, Babylonian captivity when the people of Israel were taken out of their land and held in slavery. And they would have understood the pain, the anguish, the separation of families, the death of people that would cause them great pain. And so it's saying here, the voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning, and Rachel weeping for her children. Now Rachel was already dead. She was in her tomb near Bethlehem. But the idea is that Israel was suffering. And Rachel if she had been alive, would have been weeping for what was occurring to her people. And so we see this is what Matthew is saying, though this is talking too, that actually happened, but also it was sharing what would happen when the Messiah came, and Jesus would be the one who would fulfill that. And so Matthew is showing how Israel weeps once again as prophecy is fulfilled with the act of Herod killing the male children two years and younger. And so here you have the prophecy. Hosea's prophecy is fulfilled. Now you see Jeremiah's prophecy is fulfilled. And what was occurring as Jesus and his family flees to Egypt, as Herod brings about this horrible act of killing those those children, boys to and under, that's what the Old Testament prophets said would happen when what? When the true Messiah came. And so Matthew makes that case, but he also has a third illustration, the fulfillment of prophecy in the home in Nazareth in chapter 2, again verses 19 to 23. And here you have the final childhood home of Jesus. This is where he will be raised in Nazareth. Look at how the events unfold and also to see, uh, again, Matthew's making the case. Old Testament prophecy being fulfilled in Christ shows that he is the promised king of Israel. It says, verse 19, now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the young child's life are dead. So Herod's died, now it's safe to go back to Israel. Then he arose, took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. And so he's, they're leaving Egypt. They get to go back home. They get to go back to Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go there. So what was happening? Well, Joseph's obeying God. He's going back to Israel. He's got to figure out where they will set up their home. And he hears, well, Herod's son is now in charge. Herod's son was no better than his father. Uh, he was the same type of person. Uh, it was all about him, his power, and he didn't care what he had to do to keep it. And so when uh, Joseph figures this out, he's got to, where will I set up our home where we will be safe? And it says, being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee. So he's going to move into Galilee, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled. Once again, what's Matthew saying? Jesus is going to end up in Nazareth just as the Old Testament prophets said that it would happen. And he's doing so because it would lead to Scripture being fulfilled. He shall be called a Nazarene. So the final childhood home of the King of Israel, Jesus, is going to be Nazareth. That's where Joseph and Mary will raise him. Uh, that's where he will be known. Jesus of Nazareth. Well, this is how it took place. 
and that's according again to Old Testament prophecy. But when you stop and you think of this, what does it mean when the Bible says Jesus was of Nazareth? What would that put in the mind of the reader of that day? What would the people of Israel think of Jesus when they, he declares himself in his ministry of being the Messiah? Well, you remember what they would say about anybody from Nazareth was seen as a nobody. Anybody from Nazareth was despicable to the Jewish people. And it's hard, and I was trying to think of illustrations of that, and maybe we could come up with something. But I think it's best just to understand that if you said you were from Nazareth as a Jew, other people would say, you're the lowest of low, you're despicable, want nothing to do with you because of where you were from. And here's God putting Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, in the city of Nazareth. Why? One of the reasons is to fulfill Scripture, Old Testament Scripture, and also to fulfill the prophecies of rejection. Throughout the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophets were told by God that when the Messiah comes the first time, what's going to happen? He's going to be despised and rejected by men. When you look at what unfolded in Jesus' life, he was despised and rejected by men, especially his own people, the nation of Israel. But that's all a part of God's plan. God had that planned, that it would occur that way. And if you turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 53, this is a well-known Old Testament passage. And it's talking about Jesus, the Messiah, being despised, rejected. It's a perfect lead-in to the Lord's table as well today. When you look, step back and look at the big picture, why did Jesus come the first time? Well, to fulfill prophecy. He came the first time to do what? To be rejected and to die on the cross for the purpose of saving sinners. And that's what the Old Testament prophets were saying would happen, but Israel missed it. Uh, they didn't understand it, but they were right in the plan of God. And so you have Old Testament prophecies, prophets that were saying, when the Messiah comes, he's going to be rejected. Isaiah 53, you would see the fulfillment even in him being in Nazareth here. Who had believed our report... And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form of comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. What's, how was that fulfilled? Remember what Scripture says? When people saw Jesus, he looked like any other man. There was no distinguishing factor Sorry, he wasn't born with a halo above his head. Uh, that did not happen. He was just like anybody else. But Isaiah, the prophets of old, said this would occur. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Is that, isn't that exactly what Israel did with Jesus the Messiah? Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. So the Old Testament prophet Isaiah is saying Jesus is going to be rejected, despised, but he's going to go to the cross and he's going to pay the penalty for our sin. He's going to make it possible for us to be forgiven before a holy God. And all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now there's, there's the beauty of God's plan. He came, despised, rejected, 
but it was God's plan for him to go to the cross and take our sin upon him so that we no longer uh, have to answer for our sin and fear the wrath of God. We can say what? Jesus paid it all. Jesus took care of my sin. And he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Now what does that speak of? The willingness of Jesus Christ to carry out the will of God the Father. Uh, he did not fight against the false charges. He did not fight against the soldiers and the nation of Israel taking him to the cross. Uh, he willingly gave himself up in order for the plan of God to be fulfilled to bring glory to the name of God in saving sinners. And so he was led as a lamb to slaughter and a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people he was stricken and they made his grave with the wicked but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Jesus was the sinless, perfect sacrifice, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He was put to him in grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. And so you, here you see what's Matthew stating. He says, look at these three Old Testament prophets, prophecies being fulfilled in Christ. He was put in Nazareth as a part of the fact that he would be rejected by men. He would come from a place like that. God set that up. And we see here the Jews reject him. Matthew's saying, this is what you've done. You've rejected Jesus. You've taken the king. You're king of the Jews. But in so doing, you're right in step with God's plan. God's plan to take the gospel message to all nations, to take the gospel message to the Gentiles during this church age in which we live. And the kingdom plan for Israel, that's yet future. And you can look at the Old Testament, New Testament prophecy that says this is what God's going to do with Israel in the future. And if you know your scriptures, then you know that the next prophetic event that the scripture talks about is the coming of Jesus Christ for his church. And we are looking forward to that. What's the likelihood of that? Flip a coin? Not if you understand the Bible. Not if you understand prophetic scripture. It's certain. It's true. It will happen. And because of faith and salvation, we believe that Jesus Christ is coming again. And I know if you, you talk to people about that who do not know the Lord, what do they think? Uh, you guys, you know, keep that to yourself. Or maybe you're losing your mind. But what does the Bible say? Well, the cross, the truth of the cross, truth about Jesus, it's foolishness to them. They don't understand it unless what? They know the grace of God, bringing salvation, opening their eyes to the truth of the gospel, and then you believe. We believe Jesus Christ is coming again. Why? Because he's declared it in Scripture. And we want to hold to that. We want to stick to it. And that's what Matthew was saying to those Jewish readers especially. Jesus was your Messiah. You rejected him. But that's God's plan to save people from all around the world. And he's building his church today. Nothing will stop it. He's coming for his church. And then he's going to turn his attention back to Israel uh, in future events that the Bible talks about. And so as you look at Jesus Christ, as you look at the Christmas season, uh, look at it through the Gospel of Matthew. Yes, prophecy. Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, things of this nature, born to a virgin. Those things were fulfilled in Jesus. The wise men came, just as prophecy said. 
that that would occur. They came as he was a little older. And again, why is that there? Reminding us God has a plan. Nothing's going to stop it. He let the Old Testament prophets know about it, tell the people of Israel. But also, go further. Don't leave Jesus in the manger, but remember who he is today. He's the risen Savior. He's in a glorified state. He's ruling over his church today. He's building his church, and by the grace of God, we have the privilege of being a part of that. And we can emphasize, underline, only by the grace of God. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. We can't figure it out on our own. But by the grace of God, he saved us because Jesus was willing to come, be born as a baby, the creator, and then go to the cross and pay the penalty for our sins, that this is God's plan. And you want to go beyond the manger. And then also, I'd say, go beyond today. Look at New Testament, prophecy in the Bible that talks about what? Well, here's what God tells us is going to happen in the future. Jesus is coming again. And when you gather around the Lord's table, what did Jesus say? He says, remember me. Declare your faith in my shed blood on your behalf. Declare your faith in believing that I came and gave myself for you remembering his body given for us. But what does he say? Until he comes. We're also declaring our faith and our belief that Jesus Christ is coming again. And that could be this year. It could be today, maybe before the year ends. But we are looking forward to, we believe the Bible is true. We believe the prophecy of the Bible. You know, I was, you think about scripture, prophetic scripture. It has been fulfilled. It is being fulfilled. And if it's yet to be fulfilled, it will happen because it's from God. And God is in control. And anything that he declares is true, authoritative. You can trust it. You can believe it. Be encouraged to keep looking for the coming of Jesus. And it's going to be a lot different than when he first came because he's going to come for his church and then eventually he's going to come in great power and great glory. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we praise and thank you for the word of God. We thank you that we have truth that we can believe, truth that you use to strengthen us, encourage us, Truth that gives us a, a way to go and to live in this world in such a way that we have a purpose, we have answers to all of life's situations, we have the direction on how to love God and how to love one another, and we thank you for the word of God that gives us the, uh, the truth, that also gives us a glimpse of the future, the prophecy of what is yet to come. And we thank you that Christ came the first time. We look forward to his coming for us as the church. And we just are so, again, thankful and want to give you all the praise and all the glory for your plan of salvation that does not depend on our works, that does not depend on who we are, but is centered completely and totally in putting our faith and trust in that great gift of Jesus Christ. And we thank you and give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.